Hi. With this, with this quick lecture, I just wanted to review external flows. I noticed that in the uh, NCEES handbook, this was all they really had with regard to drag force and external flows. So it's going to be a quite a limited range of things they could talk about. The force of drag, uh, by definition, is equal to the coefficient of drag times the dynamic pressure rho v squared by 2 times the area. So rho v squared by 2 is a pressure times area would give you force, right? And the only coefficients of drag they provided are these guys right here. So that's drag on a flat plate placed parallel to a flow stream. So you get a flat plate, you got a flow stream here, the velocity is v. What's the drag force in that direction? That's what that is. Not a lot of questions they could ask you based on that. Uh, the uh, the thing they could do is give you the drag coefficients, and then you could you could make some calculations there. So here is the definition for drag coefficient. That's just rearranging the previous page, and then also uh, noticing what the definition for work and for power is. So um, the total drag force is the viscous drag plus the pressure drag divided by the dynamic pressure times the area. I've written here is total drag force. Once we know the total drag force here, we can multiply it times the distance traversed. That would be the work. Or to get the power, that would be force times distance divided by time. And that would be force really times velocity. And that's pretty useful because oftentimes we've got an object moving through air. It requires a force to get it to go through air or water or whatnot. And it's going at a certain velocity, so we could calculate how much power that requires. This is the dynamic pressure, and that's the frontal projected area. That's a good point there. That uh, the area that we're talking about would be the area that this object would make um, uh, a shadow cast on the wall. So if this is a circular cylinder and the flow is going this way, the area is the diameter, the height, times the length, not the surface area or anything else. So it's that frontal projected area. All right, drag force is composed of two components, a skin friction drag and a pressure drag. That's for non-lifting bodies like a circular cylinder or something. If there's a lifting uh, component, then there's additional vortices that are generated, these wingtip vortices and things like that. And that induces an additional drag called induced drag. So for lifting bodies, there's three components to drag. Let's talk about each component. Let's talk about the drag component, so the pressure drag. Where it comes from is this. This is the inviscid solution, right? So if you had a circular cylinder and you calculated using uh, inviscid flow theory what the pressure profile would be on the cylinder, you would get this expression right here. The coefficient of pressure is 1 minus 4 times sine squared theta. If I plotted it, it would look like this, basically a sine wave. So the pressure is very high at the leading edge. That stagnation where the flow comes to rest gives up all of its kinetic energy to pressure. So you get the maximum pressure. And then as the velocity increases, as the velocity goes up from zero, Bernoulli equation says the pressure's got to go down. And so the pressure drops, 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 drops. And so the maximum velocity is here at the top where you get the minimum pressure. And then the velocity slows again as you come towards the second stagnation point in the back. So this is where it slows, and here's the second stagnation. So when these kinds of analyses were first done, people didn't even know the no-slip boundary condition was true. So they didn't realize that this is irrotational or inviscid because uh, the no-slip boundary condition says that there should be a gradient of velocity along this cylinder. So they're like, hey, why are we not getting drag? What this says is, is that the pressure profile fore and aft the cylinder is the same. So that means you get all this pressure, right? All this positive pressure and then some negative pressure acting on the front of the cylinder. And you have the same positive and negative pressure acting on the back of the cylinder. So they cancel each other out. So there's no pressure drag for the inviscid flow. But that's not reality. The reality is something like this. Here's a laminar flow field. And the flow comes along, and it hits the, the circular cylinder. There's laminar flow 
uh, along the top of the cylinder, and then at some point it just can't get itself around. It can't negotiate that turn anymore. So the flow separates and comes flying off, right? It leaves in its, in, in, behind it this wake region, this kind of dead region of flow. So what the pressure profile looks like, and we'd get this in a wind tunnel, is you would follow along with the, with the laminar flow solution. The velocity is increasing and increasing, and the pressure is dropping and dropping. But then at some point, the flow separates, right? And the velocity back there in this swirly region is kind of all constant, so the pressure is constant. And so you get this kind of flatness here. Separation occurs at about 82 degrees. That's about right here. Right? And the pressure is basically flat in that region behind. So you got all of this positive pressure on top, and then you didn't get any positive pressure on the back. Right? You lost that. So that means you got all this positive pressure on the front, sorry, not the top, and, and very low pressure on the back, so you end up with a net drag force. That's the pressure drag. Now, in the turbulent flow, what happens is, is that the boundary layer, the, the flow velocity is large enough so the boundary layer is turbulent in here. That means that it has all directions of component. It's swirling along. So this turbulent flow is better able to get around the cylinder and get back there before separating, right? So it separates much later, about 120 degrees. So here's the profile. It follows the inviscid flow, and then it comes around and it almost gets to the to the minimum pressure, and then it begins to recover. And it does a much better job recovering than the laminar flow. And then it separates at about whatever this is. Uh, this says 120 degrees, so it's saying that's separation there. Pretty flat after separation. But you got a lot of pressure recovery. You got a lot of high pressure on the back of this cylinder, pushing it, helping it to uh, resist drag. So that's at a, a Reynolds number of about 6.7 times 10 to the fifth, and a little bit higher Reynolds number. Uh, you're not getting as much recovery back there, but it's still better than the laminar flow. So this is the motivation to put spoilers on cars or whatnot to turn that flow and to reduce the size of the wake. All right, the skin friction comes about due to the no-slip boundary condition. The flow comes along at its velocity, it stagnates here, and then it begins to flow along the cylinder. But all the while, it has to be zero, the flow has to be zero on the cylinder itself. And the external flow out here is the velocity in the wind. So there's this gradient, there's this massive gradient in the velocity from the free stream velocity down to zero. And the shear stress right, is that gradient, the change in velocity with, re change with respect to the change in the independent coordinate directions. So this are the shear stress terms. This guy right here is the volumetric. You can kind of neglect it for incompressible flows. So the fact that there is this gradient of velocity results in a shear stress. That's the takeaway message. That's what skin friction is. So look at this. Here's a nice question. Which of these shapes has the lowest total drag coefficient, right? And let's talk about why you just wouldn't pick this one right here. The reason you wouldn't pick it is because CD is defined as the force divided by 1 half rho v squared times the frontal area, right? So here's a plot. Here we're plotting drag versus 1 half rho v squared times the frontal area. So in this guy, the frontal area is quite small. The result is a large coefficient of drag. Down here, that frontal area is large, so a relatively low coefficient of drag. So that's driving the CD. The, uh, the very thin are driving the coefficient of drag very large out here. And what have I got going on here? Here's the airfoil. This is thickness to cord length. So that's T over C. That's what this is. So as this value goes up, the thickness is going up. So when the thickness is thin, basically the coefficient of drag for that goes to, goes to infinity. Now I'm not talking about drag on a flat plate. I'm talking about the drag of this object. All right. So, uh, however, the, uh, the uh, skin friction drag is decreasing, and the pressure drag is increasing. So the pressure drag is, comes from the fact that as this gets fatter, you're going to have more and more separation, increasing the pressure drag. 
So it's this trade-off between it going to infinity at zero and the pressure drag uh, getting large as the thickness gets large. So your total drag shape, your coefficient of drag, looks something that's that curve right there. So the sweet spot is about 0.2 thickness to chord ratio, and that's about this shape right here, which maybe is what you picked, right? Just your eye said. There's something about that that looks very aerodynamic. All right, so all told, here's the drag coefficient of a, sear, a sphere and a cylinder as a function of Reynolds number, and it's divided into various regions. This low drag region, uh, sorry, this low Reynolds number region is called the Stokes flow. That's really almost an inviscid flow. That's what you would get, very high coefficient of drag. And then at some point, the flow begins to separate, and it no longer looks like that, that symmetric uh, streamline pattern that we had. You get the wake and separation. Uh, and then you get the laminar region, this, this vortex shedding region, this wake region where all this turbulent is in the wake. But the boundary layer itself, the BL, the boundary layer, is still laminar. And then when the boundary layer becomes turbulent, you get the sharp drop in drag. So that's your classic sort of uh, behavior for both flows over cylinders and spheres. All right, 2D versus 3D drag. Um, in general, if you go into a wind tunnel and you make a measurement of drag, you're measuring the 2D drag. You would stretch the object uh, across the wind tunnel and it would be bound, so a circular cylinder is bound in the wind tunnel. And what you lose here is all of the vorticity generated at the tip. And those are, those are generally uh, helping or hurting. So in the case of drag, it, the vorticity allows the pressure to uh, come to equilibrium. So you're, you're bleeding off pressure differences across the end of the circular cylinder and you actually end up reducing the measured drag as a result. So the 2D drags, right, the finite length 3D objects usually have smaller measured coefficients of drag than 2D objects for that reason, because of that bleed over effect. So here's a circular cylinder for laminar flows. Uh, you, get a, you get a drag of 0.13, and for turbulent flows, you get a drag of 0.3. So I'm talking about this curve right here. Laminar, it's a f very flat in this region about 0.13, and turbulent, maybe there on average, of about 0.3. Here's a squatty little cylinder, an L over D, so it's a finite length cylinder, and uh, you can see that the drag coefficient is, uh, is, is getting larger as it approaches the 2D, or the infinitely long cylinder. And so at uh, infinity, the, the, the drag is 1.2, which corresponds to the laminar drag. So this is a wind tunnel test here where the end is not capped. It's just free in the wind tunnel to, to allow the pressure really at, uh, at, the, at that uh, section not to have this variation that we saw, but rather a flat profile all the way across in pressure because of, because of the way it would just short circuit. All right, let's do a couple of examples and call it a day. A truck whose frontal dimensions are 11 foot tall by 7 foot wide, so that's the projected area of the front of the truck, operates at an average velocity or an average speed of 40 miles per hour. The drag coefficient without this deflector right here is uh, 0.96, and with it, it's 0.76, so a nice reduction in the drag coefficient. What's the power savings of adding the wind deflector? horsepower-wise. These are all significant horsepowers, right? So uh, a lawnmower engine is nowhere near this. So if you could save that much gasoline, that would be quite a benefit for just putting a piece of plastic up there. So let's calculate the force, and then we can calculate the horsepower by multiplying by the velocity, as we saw earlier. So the drag force is rearrange that equation I showed you in the beginning, CD times dynamic pressure, one-half rho v squared times the frontal area, blah, 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 blah. There it is. It takes, uh, it takes 296 pounds force to push the frontal area 11 by 7 through the wind. That's what that's saying. That's without that uh, spoiler. And then with it, it's going to take 235 pounds force to push that frontal area through the wind. So to calculate the power, we multiply the uh, force calculated times the velocity. So there's 
296 and 235 times 40 miles per hour, plus a bunch of unit stuff, 31 versus 25. So the difference is about 6 horsepower. That's quite significant, right? 6 horsepower. All right, let's do another example. Here's a parachute. What's the steady rate of descent or the terminal velocity of a parachutist with a total weight of 200 pounds force and a 9 meter diameter parachute? There's some possible answers. So this is a drag uh, problem as well. It's really uh, kind of a, a statics problem, really. If I write a force balance, I have drag acting in this direction and weight as a force acting in that direction. We're neglecting buoyancy and things like that. So um, this is my... Uh, Newton's law, ma is equal to the sum of the forces. And the fact that this is asking for the terminal velocity means that, that the acceleration is zero. So I can get rid of the acceleration here. And I just get that uh, the, the weight is equal to the drag. So the weight is mg and the drag is cd one half rho v squared times a. And I can rearrange this for the uh, velocity. And so I uh, get 2 times this 200 pounds times 1.4. So this is an estimate based on the uh, circular cylinder from before. And the density and uh, the projected area, so it's about 6 feet. I think in general, uh, you would have to be told what this CD coefficient is. But there you go. All right. What? It's over. What a drag.